All right, so, um, hi everybody. I'm Lauren Ring, I'm one of the hospitalists. Um, this is the first time I've tried Polev, um, and so we'll try to see if this works, so bear with me, but um, we're just gonna go through some of the mix up questions that I think are hopefully gonna be helpful in being not too um, zebra, but hopefully practical too. So um, because you can't fit a whole mix up question uh, easily in a slide, um, I kind of broke it up. Um, so just first, um, we can go through the question and then uh, answer it. So um, this question, I always kind of, when I'm answering these questions in Mixapp and even on tests, I look at the question stem first um, because sometimes it can help you frame through how you're reading um, the, the question. So in this case, you know, which of the following is the most appropriate screening test um, to uh, perform before initiating Chimera? So this is a 25-year-old woman. Um, she's evaluated for a two-month history of increasing joint pain and swelling. She has rheumatoid arthritis that was diagnosed a year ago. She was initially treated with methotrexate with good response, but recently had more pain and swelling with, incre um, uh, with increased methotrexate dose, as well as the sulfazalazine and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, there was improvement, but an incomplete control of the disease. She also takes naproxen daily. On physical exam, her vitals are normal, BMI 23. She has two MCP joints of both hands that are tender and swollen. There's palpable warmth and tenderness of both wrists. The remainder of the examination is normal. Lab studies uh, are notable for an ESR of 45, a CRP of 1.8, uh, rheumatoid factor of 112, and then hepatitis B and hepatitis C serologies are negative. And so the decision is, uh, made to start treatment with adalimumab or Humira. So in the setting of all of this, what is the appropriate next screening test to perform um, before initiating uh, adalimumab? Okay. And then if you guys want me to go back to the question, just let me know. Um, and if you guys are on poll F, um, you can just text A, B, C, or D, and hopefully we'll see if this goes through. Hopefully this is active. All right, I'll give you guys just another maybe 30 seconds to respond. Right. Um, so I'll give you the breakdown. I would try to show you the screens, um, but about 14% um, said A, 14% said B, and about 71% said C. Um, so anybody who had, you know, A, B, or C want to respond and say why they, why they chose those things? Okay, uh, okay, well, we can go to the answer. Um, so the answer is C. Um, and so we can kind of get into to why that is. Um, so you, before you start Humira, you want to uh, check um, 
to screen for TB. And part of this has to do with just the relationship between, um, so Humira, remembering what Humira it is. So it's a TNF alpha inhibitor um, and um, <clears throat> TNF alpha inhibitors are particularly uh, worrisome in tuberculosis because they can inhibit formation of a granuloma. Um, and so patients who either um, may have been exposed to TB and don't have super active disease or latent disease or just, um, you know, they lose that ability to, con to uh, contain the disease when you start TNF alphas um, inhibitors. Um, so kind of more about why this patient is started on, on um, TNF, you know, starting on Humira, you know, she's already on triple therapy um, <clears throat> for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and she's got some high-risk prognostic uh, markers, uh, including her positive RF factor, her high inflammatory markers that just um, make us think that she's going to be more resistant to treatment. Um, you know, other things that we looked at, so, you know, thinking about checking a chest x-ray. Um, again, probably a good thought when you're thinking about diagnosing um, TB if it's active, but, um, you know, certainly in this case, you would want to have, um, you know, a, a more sensitive test. Um, uh, and then immunoglobulin levels is kind of something to throw in there, but it's just, you know, something if you're, that'd be a better test if you're thinking about um, common variable immunodeficiency. Um, and these patients would usually present a little bit differently as far as usually having recurrent infections, um, commonly um, sinus or pulmonary infections, ear infections, all of that kind of stuff. And so um, doesn't seem as consistent with this patient. And then none of you guys said this, but certainly you don't need to get imaging of the hands since we already have a confirmed diagnosis. And then even just on the physical examination and laboratory testing, we can tell that her disease is just not as well controlled. Let's see, I see some chat here. Can we post the pulled info in the chat? Oh, the, oh perfect. Yeah, we got it all in there for you. No questions yet about this particular question. Okay, cool. Um, and I think this is a good one. It's just a good reminder um, that before we start um, treatment for some of these rheumatologic, um, especially the anti-TNF uh, inhibitors, just to do the screening for TB, because disseminated TB is bad. So question two, um, what is the, the uh, following is the most appropriate treatment. So this is a 72-year-old man um, evaluated in the emergency department for acute onset of pain and swelling in the left knee. He was diagnosed with community-acquired pneumonia four days ago, and a seven-day course of chlorithromycin was started at that time. He reports marked improvement of his respiratory symptoms. History is also significant for gout, which attacks occurring approximately once a year hypertension, uh, diet control diabetes, and CKD. Uh, other medications include nifedipine and hydrochlorothiazide. On uh, physical examination, the temperature is 37.1, blood pressure is 117 over 86, uh, and heart rate is 76. Um, his BMI is 32. He's got mildly decreased breath sounds in the right lung uh, midfield, um, and his left knee is swollen, red, warm, tender, fluctuant with a limited range of motion. Laboratory studies are significant for a leukocyte count of 7.2 thousand. He's got a serum creatinine level of 1.7, and his radiograph of the left knee is normal. So you tap that joint, and the synovial fluid shows a leukocyte count of 20,000 and extracellular and intracellular uric crystals, and it negative gram stain. So which is which of the following is the next appropriate treatment? What's that? Okay. Let me make sure this goes on. Hold on one sec. Okay. And before you guys answer, let me just make sure I can get there. Okay. There.
All right. So we have um, responses. So Michigan, I could show you guys these graphs. Um, but so for A, we have nobody chose that. For B, we had 71% of people choose that. For C, we had nobody. And then for D, we had 29%. So, um, you know, I, I guess the, the first question is, is, so it looks like everybody's kind of in uh, agreement that this is uh, gout. Um, someone say why they chose B for colchicine. It looks like Sarah's joined us. Welcome, Sarah. Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, finishing up with a patient. I'm so sorry for being late. Don't Where apologize for taking care of patients. <laughs> uh. Yeah, exactly. Sarah's uh, Steinger, uh, Krieger is just suggesting if, if people have a reason why they chose B or D, For D, this is Megan. So for D, um, I didn't, I don't remember if the, he has a reason he can't get intraarticular steroids, but my understanding is that is the first line therapy for monoarticular gout. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, someone here says chose. Um, you know, D, because it's exposure, you're reducing uh, systemic exposure. Is anybody familiar with a reason why B might be risky in this particular patient? And um, we can kind of go back to the question. I know it's not super fair because we're going back, but um, if you guys see that he has started on some new medications, including clarithromycin, um, this was something I don't think I was actually aware of until doing this review. So the answer is, is um, so colchicine, um, my understanding and, um, and um, Dr. Chung, you can weigh on this as well. I don't, I, I think I've used colchicine and CKD in my experience, but usually you're a little bit dose uh, limited in it. So you, you may give only one dose or two doses. Um, yeah, usually um, for kind of mild, uh, you know, reductions in GFR, we actually renally dose it, which would be mm. half a tab once a day. It's like 0.6 milligrams QD. Um, and so you do 0.3. But um, the toxicity, of course, increases with further renal decline. So we actually kind of practically, on a practical level, avoid it in CKD. But it's not entirely contraindicated. It's just dose reduced. Yeah, so um, the answer for this, which I thought was interesting, is um, it would be D, so the intraarticular glucocorticoid injections. Um, and I think you guys hit on some of the things that I thought were important, um, which is, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, one joint that's affected, so it's not everywhere. Um, you've already ruled out a presence of, you know, an infected joint or something that would just make this, um, uh, more danger, you know, kind of more dangerous to do this injection. And then um, this patient has some contraindications of some of the other treatments. And one that I thought was actually really important because colchicine, especially if this patient didn't have CKD, might be something I would go to earlier, um, especially if he had more. But but um, uh, there's actually been case studies and reports of, um, or I guess it's known that um, you know colchicine is metabolized by the SIP. Um, three, four enzyme. And so um, if you give clarithromycin, um, this can actually lead to colchicine toxicity and death. And so if patients are taking these drugs concurrently, you, you should not give colchicine concurrently with clarithromycin. 
You know, one question I had, um, Dr. Chung, for you is um, this patient was on hydrochlorothiazide, which um, for blood pressure management, which I thought was a very interesting choice for a patient with known gout. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on yeah. that. Yeah, so remember that thiazides um, will uh, cause hyperuricemia or CAM. And um, also, you know, loop diuretics too. Although patients typically get gout, and they come in for like, you know, crazy diuresis for heart failure, mostly because of fluid shift. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it is a bizarre choice. It's a definite board's, <laughs> board's little plant in there. Um, low sartan are actually um, have a uricus uric effect. So sometimes we actually ask, the cardiologist, if we just change um, the the thiazide to an ARB. I think. Yeah, looks like joint uh, is something hard. Oh, oh, never mind. You're on it, Sarah. Go. Oh, I was just good reading. Like, if the one joint is something harder to inject, like the toe, pragmatically, would joint injection still be the choice? Which of these choices would be used if we couldn't inject that joint? Yeah, it's a good point. And the other thing to remember about gout is like, we classically think of it as being in the joint, but like oftentimes these uric acid crystals can, they, they line everything. They line like tendon sheets and you can get four foot gout, what to do. Um, I mean, I think in that scenario, then systemic steroids would be, you know, the next option. Of course, in rheumatology, a toe is, we would inject the toe. <laughs> we would inject some weird stuff. But uh but on a practical level, when you're you're seeing the patient in clinic, you know, then in that case, steroids should be fine. And it can refer the win. That's right. Um, calcineurin inhibitors, like also kind of a should raise bells in your mind if there's a risk for colchicine toxicity. And it comes into play oftentimes inpatient when you're seeing these transplant um, folks who've got uh, a flare of their gout in house. So, um, yeah, great, great. Other questions or thoughts about this question? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was really interesting because I just was not a aware of the cult of the colchicine and clarithromycin um, interactions and it looks like it's a you know pretty strong uh, contraindication so always a good reminder to check those meds do a good med rec cool um so we can go to the next question so um let me just close this so here we have a 61-year-old uh, man who's evaluated with a 10-month history of generalized weakness. He has no pain or myalgias. His history is significant for hypercholesterolemia. He's got, um, this was treated with simvastatin for the past three years. On physical example, uh, his temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate are all pretty normal. His BMI is 27. He's got symmetric weakness in his arm and thigh muscles with slightly reduced grip and power of the finger flexors. Um, no muscle tenderness is noted. There is no rash, skin thickening, or digital ulcers. Reflexes in the remainder of the physical exam are normal. Laboratory studies are notable for a normal complete blood count, um, an ESR of 23, and a CK of 365. Chest uh, x-ray is normal, um, and an EMG and nerve conduction studies show uh, myopathic changes in the proximal and distal muscles of the extremities as well as some neurogenic changes. So which of the following in the setting of all of this is the most likely diagnosis? So let me just go to all right. Oops. Sorry about that. All right. There's a request to go back to the question stem. Sure, absolutely.
And then probably move back to the questions so we can see the options when they're voting. That is fair. All right. So uh, right now the breakdown is, so A, there's 0%, uh, B uh, is 78%, the C is, looks like it's hovering between kind of changing 5 and 8%, and statin or induced myopathy or D is about 15%. So if somebody feels comfortable kind of answering, what are some of the, and I can go back to the, the, um, the question stem, what are some of the things that kind of help you decide what's going on? And what helped you choose why you chose, you know, your answer? Okay, so we're getting some answers here. So Rashid said, I don't suspect statin-related muscle disease given five years on stable dosing. And Rebecca, oh, lots of good answers here. Rebecca says, the combination of non-tender and weak points to the inclusion body myositis, more distal involvement associated with inclusion body, and also statin-induced myopathy is usually tenderness, not so much weak. All right. Uh, any other thoughts? So I think you guys did a good job. The answer is uh, B, um, inclusion body myositis. Um, and I think you guys kind of picked up on, I think, some of the important things in my mind, definitely, um, you know, with this weakness and the, you know, CK, I would think, you know, the stat, you know, statin-induced myopathy or um, inclusion body myositis. I agree that the tender in it without having tenderness, um, you know, that would certainly point against statin induced myopathy. I, I have seen cases where people have been weak, and maybe Dr. Chung, you can um, weigh in. There's one patient I saw who had statin induced myopathy who like couldn't lift their arms up and take their shirt off. Um, but again, it was in the setting of a changed dose of their statin, uh, switched to a different statin, so it was you know, relatively new. Um, but I think that the big things that, you know, for this question is, you know, I think um, you're thinking about the age, he's been on a stable statin dose, um, his lab findings, so his CK is typically not super elevated as, and his isn't, and then the neuromuscular, like the uh, EMG findings are, are more classic with inclusion uh, body myositis. Um, I think Cody on here says the ALS would show more a mix of upper and lower motor neuron signs, and that's exactly right. Um, and this patient doesn't have, have the upper motor neuron signs. Um, I would say that what really in the question stem makes this inclusion body myositis is what Anne is saying about how this patient has finger flexor distal weakness. That is precisely what defines this myopathy from the other inflammatory myopathies, where you get largely proximal, you know, shoulder, pelvic girdle, hip flexor uh, involvement. Inclusion body, you also get not only proximal involvement, but you get um, distal um, muscle involvement as well. And I will say that actually the main feature for these myopathies is weakness rather than tenderness. Like contrast this picture to say polymyalgia rheumatica. Polymyalgia rheumatica um, is a very similar distribution. 
Um, but typically PMR is stiffness and pain. Um, whereas myopathies tend to be much more like weakness and, you know, it's hard. Tenderness, you can get that because everything gets deconditioned. You're getting like a rotator cuff, you know, associated rotator cuff tendinopathy because you're just trying to compensate and, um, that can cause, you know, pain too. So, um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Any questions or thoughts or anything else that you guys have about the question or why we, you know, why you choose this or not another answer? One of my favorite guitarists, Peter Frampton, has um, inclusion body myositis. It should be in your differential for like those folks that you're seeing who are just having recurrent falls, like elderly man having recurrent falls over like a year mm -hmm. might do strength testing when you see them in clinic. Sarah, your favorite guitarist is Peter Frampton. I love Peter. Well, he's not my favorite, but he's definitely like <laughs> in the top. Yeah, and he was saying how like his, his he was just noticing like his, you know, fingerings weren't, you know, like his fingers wouldn't go to the place they want to go. And he actually had a couple of like, really embarrassing falls on stage oh, wow. and um yeah and it took him on average it takes these patients honestly a long time to cut to the diagnosis um because they easily kind of explain it off in their minds but i know yeah i mean that's i think i've seen i've seen it once and i remember it was one of those things was a really hard diagnosis to for the patient to get, I think it took like five years or something like that for him to ultimately get diagnosed. I don't know if that's classic, but it was, yeah. it was a, yeah. it took a really long time. Yeah, yeah. So. Great. Uh, other questions? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good <laughs> oh my gosh awesome so question four so what is uh which of the following is the most appropriate diagnostic uh test to perform uh next so um this is a 34 year old woman she's um uh, here for a follow-up visit for polymyositis. She was diagnosed one year ago. She responded really well to therapy. She's currently got no weakness, chest pain, shortness of breath on exertion. Her current med uh, medications are prednisone and azathioprine. On physical examination, her temperature is normal, blood pressure is normal, heart rate, respiration is 26. Her BMI is 23. Um, her oxygen stat is 98% on ambient or room air, uh, depending on which way you go. Um, her cardiac and pulmonary exams are normal. Her strength is normal in the proximal and distal muscles. She's got slight hyperkeratosis and cracking on the palmar surfaces uh, of the hands, and there are no other rashes, skin thickening, or distal ulcers. <clears throat> her lab studies are notable for a CK of 100, an ANA titer of 1 to 1280, and an anti joe antibody that's positive. Her EKG is normal. So just reminding ourselves what the question is, is which of the following is the most appropriate diagnostic test to perform next? So, question. And if we need to go back to the stem, definitely let me know. We can go kind of back and forth. Back to the stem, we can do that.
see a good number of answers here. So for our distribution, it looks like it's about fluctuating it, uh, between about 20, 25% saying A, the six minute walk test. Um, uh, about B, it looks like it's about 15%. C, it's been fluctuating between 30 and 40 percent. D is zero, and then E, uh, no additional testing is 20 percent. So, for those of you who chose the six-minute walk test, um, would somebody be willing to say kind of what they're looking for and why they chose that? And then, if you chose B, C, or E, if you guys can think about why you chose that like what you're looking for or why you're not looking for anything. So Vin said you're concerned for ILD. And what did you choose? I think um, similar to Vince, I was concerned about maybe early ILD and a six minute walk test might show up a decrease in um, uh, exertional capacity and maybe some shortness of breath on exertion that's sort of subclinical. Maybe she hasn't noticed before, or maybe she'll desat a little bit when she's walking. And so it might just be an early way to pick up ILD. Anybody have the answers for B or C or other conditions they're concerned about? So, um, you know, you guys are right in identifying that the concern you have is ILD, um, but it's interesting because what they choose as an answer um, is is actually the chest X-ray, um, as far as kind of being the best, you know, screening test initially to look for ILD. Um, and so, um, you know, I think one of the reasons why, you know, there's you can kind of go through the different answers is that, you know, sometimes even screening for ILD, just getting the initial imaging, whether it's a chest X-ray or a CT scan or something like that, that you can start to see changes on, um, on the imaging before patients will present with symptoms. Um, in my mind, I think it's a lot easier test to probably get than the six minute, minute uh, walk test. Um, and the way that Mixap kind of explains it is that they thought that the six minute walk test is important with patients who have pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, is kind of once you've already established a diagnosis and you can kind of follow how they're doing. Um, but, you know, I think one of the reasons why they would say do the, this chest x-ray um, or at least do the chest imaging early is that sometimes patients can be uh, asymptomatic with um, ILD and that um, this is just a more sensitive way to, to find it. And she's got risk factors that increase her likelihood of, of um, developing ILD, I mean, particularly her anti jo one antibodies. I don't know, Dr. Chung, if you, in your practice, you have other, other thoughts. Um, and it looks like Ruth is also asking here, um, would we also be doing a malignancy workup? Mm. Yeah, good question. I mean, Probably chest x-ray is the best choice out of all of these for screening for interstitial lung disease. Um, and then remember that ILD is one of the five hallmark features for antisympathase syndrome. So fever, inflammatory arthritis, uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, the dry cracking on the skin, that's, they're referring to mechanics hand, and then ILD. So, um, and, you know, as you were saying, Warren, these patients tend to have good reserves, so they, you know, don't, um, you know, necessarily notice dyspnea, but the ILD is there, and the earlier we treat it, the better outcome. So, um, 
Yeah, and then usually when you, you do that, you'll see it, then you'll refer them for um, high resolution chest CT and it'll usually be a nonspecific interstitial pneumonia and SIP pattern. So Cody's asking, what is the role of, for high res CT in asymptomatic patients? Um, in patients who have um, this presentation, um, they will invariably uh, get it if their um, chest X-ray is showing um, interstitial changes. Um, because it's also the, the number one reason for mortality in these patients is interstitial lung disease. They don't really die from um, like their mechanic pants or their Raynaud's. Um, and then someone asked, would these antibodies automatically be ordered in rheumatology in someone with polymyositis? It wouldn't be obvious for me to order this one. Um, yes, and you know, here at UW, the ANA actually will report a JIL-1, weirdly enough. Um, the rest of the myositis antibodies are um, a myositis panel that's a separate order. Um, used to be a send out to Mayo, but now we do it here in-house. Um, and the thing is with these um, myositis, it, it can feel like alphabet soup. <laughs> Um, but there's a trend now moving away from this word of polymyositis and actually defining the myositis by the antibody type because it looks to be that, um, you know, this particular antibody, PL12, has like a definite phenotype of features and a certain prognosis. And like, you know, Joe one is like a. So we usually um, don't say polymyositis anymore, but you'll see in notes like JO1 inflammatory my myositis. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of questions here. Good questions. Would you not? Oh, let's see here. Does anyone know the ballpark sensitivity for chest x-ray with ILD? Are you reassured by a negative chest x-ray if the patient's um, asymptomatic? That's a good question. I don't know actually what the sensitivity is, chest x-ray for interstitial lung disease. Um, Sarah, I think that links to the questions about the role of high res CT and whether you would be reassured of a negative chest X-ray uh, alone, or whether you would want to order a high res CT even if it were negative. Yeah, I think the chest X-ray is a good screening test. In honestly, in the real world practice, like in our UW interstitial lung disease clinic, they don't get chest X-ray; they get high res chest CT. So, I mean, I think perhaps you wouldn't feel reassured with a Joe one and a classic presentation of antisynthetase, and you would really chase that. Yeah. Or you might do a chest x-ray, they're asymptomatic, that's fine. Six months later, you'd insist that they get, you know, some sort of pulmonary imaging, because you know how this disease rolls. Um, yeah, I guess that was going to be one of my, my thoughts, too, is if you start with like a screening chest x-ray, that might just be, you know, if it's negative, it's just like there's a certain frequency of how often you would screen, in my mind, that maybe that would make sense rather than ordering, say, you know, a, a chest CT every six months until it turns positive, whether you start with chest x-ray and then just say if we're doing this serially enough, if they're asymptomatic, you know, we may not always catch it 100% of the time, but if you're, you know, systematic, you should be able to pick it up at some point at, along the, the trajectory. Yeah. And the other thing is on a practical level, these patients hardly get chest x-rays on their own. I mean, you know, it's, it's going to be coupled with the PFTs every three months. It's going to be coupled with their report of symptoms. Um, so you'll get a sense clinically what's going on. If it doesn't make sense to you that they're just nicking their, you know, DLC is kind of declining, their mm -hmm. PFT kind of trend down trending, then you're going to chase that high res DT. Sarah, that connects to Millette's question about whether PFTs are done more for screening because they might be more sensitive than chest X rays alone. Yeah, I, I don't know actually what like this, how that compares with interstitial lung disease. Um, but they are done. So uh, in clinic, we do PFTs every three months for people with myositis, especially, you know, antisensitase. Um, yeah. Gotcha. And it looks like there's oh. a question 
question about the malignancy workup? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so dermatomyositis has a really, uh, has like 15% of these patients will have an underlying malignancy. Um, there are also certain antibodies. TIP1 gamma is the big one that is like, has a really high incidence of associated malignancy. So for those folks, we do do a malignancy workup. For all folks with inflammatory myositis, we, and we go back and we make sure like, are they up to date on all, all regular um, PAP, all the um, age appropriate cancer screening. Um, for this, per, for this, uh, for synthetase, um, there isn't like an actually high incidence for malignancy, so you wouldn't really do like your chest abdomen pelvis to like look for that. But for particular high risk antibodies, yes, and for dermatomyositis, yes. Great, thank you. Other questions that you guys have or thoughts you have? And then one thing I'll add in here um, can, can kind of get confusing. JO1 can also be seen in dermatomyositis. Um, but this patient's clinical picture is not quite dermatomyositis because it's, you know, all of these antisynthetase things, the five things I mentioned, it's like, you know, arthritis and the can of hands and this and that, Raynaud's. So, um, so yeah, a JO1 is kind of, you know, maybe that, that might have been why the malignancy uh, thought came to mind. All right. Um, we can go to the next question. So um, this is a, um, so which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So always starting with that question when you read the STEM. So this is a 32 year old woman. Um, she undergoes a new patient evaluation. She was diagnosed with lupus 10 years ago. Her manifestations include arthritis, pericarditis, leukopenia, and a rash. She reports increasing difficulty using her hands due to joint deformities. Medications include hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine and prednisone. On physical exam, she's afebrile, blood pressure is normal, heart rate's normal, her respiratory rate 16, her BMI is 24. Her examinations of her hands reveal subluxation and ulnar deviation of the <clears throat> MCP joints of both hands, swan neck deformities of the fingers of both hands, uh, flexion and subluxation of the uh, MCP joint in both thumbs, and the hallux uh, var valgus of the first uh, metatarsal phalangeal joints bilaterally. Um, hand radiographs demonstrate no deformities or evidence of erosions. So, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And the question. A, hypermobility syndrome, B, uh, decode arthropathy, C, mixed uh, connective tissue disease, or D, rheumatoid arthritis. And if you guys need to go back to the STEM, uh, I can go back really quickly too. All right, um, 
So we have a good mix of everything in here, um, about it's been ranging around 10% as uh, folks said, hypermobility syndrome, uh, about 54% said jacquard arthropathy, uh, 25% said mixed connective tissue disease, and then about 15% said rheumatoid arthritis. So kind of going back to the, the stem of the questions, does someone kind of justify why they chose, you know, their answer looking at the stem, kind of what, what stuck out to them? So why did somebody choose hypermobility syndrome? If you're willing to. Or even like, what is Jakut arthropathy? Right, I didn't, to be fair, I, I didn't know. I hadn't heard of it. I have a video. Could I share my screen? Yeah. Um, okay. Can people see this? Yeah. One sec. Hey, uh, any thoughts from anybody who were they chose, or we can go to the answer too. Um, I can just talk through what I was thinking, which is that the deformity sounded classic for some with rheumatoid arthritis, but then the x ray didn't show you know, degeneration in the joint space. So then that didn't seem consistent with rheumatoid arthritis and hypermobility, I guess, I thought maybe that was referring to like an Ehrler Stanlow sort of thing. And that didn't sound correct. I actually said mixed connective tissue, but I, I actually don't think that is correct. Um, that was my thing. And that's actually great. Cause I think that, you know, part of when you're answering these questions for your, for your boards, I mean, half the battle, especially when you don't know what something is, is just being like, what can I take off the off the answers? So, agree. Like thinking about rheumatoid arthritis, like you, should, if you know her disease is that severe, his disease, I can't remember. You should start to see erosions on on X-ray, and so that yeah, that was that was great. Um, and so, um, in this case, it. You know, I think you can put it together by saying, you know, for me, the way I kind of did it was like, agreed, didn't seem like rheumatoid arthritis, um, you know, didn't seem like me to the next, you know, connect, connective tissue disease. I didn't really know what Jakut arthropathy was, so I was like, I'm just going to leave it on there because who knows. Um, and then, you know, hypermobility, um, you know, that was kind of a little bit on it, but it seems like, you know, I was wondering in my mind, she's got lupus. Could this just be some again some condition that I'm not as you know familiar with, and so that's kind of what would make me choose B, even though on a test taking thing, um, it's hard to say. And so actually, um, in the answer, it is is B, and part of that is is hypermobility um, syndrome is you know can, you know can happen in otherwise healthy individuals, and so even having something like lupus will make hypermobility um, certainly less likely. And, you know, certainly you think about hypermobility in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but then there's certainly a spectrum. So, like, for example, if you guys can see my finger, like, I have a degree of hypermobility myself. 
So I can turn my hand 360 degrees. So, <laughs> but no other medical problems that I know of at this point. So, spectrum. <laughs> And so Dr. Chung was explaining or showed the video. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts of if, how often you've seen yeah. Jitsu TV and yeah. Yeah. So um, Jacuzzi arthropathy is, um, it can look a lot like um, RA. So a lot of good thoughts. Actually, I'm going to share my screen again, if that's okay. Um, so can you guys see that? Yeah. Remember that um, kind of leaves really like where the eponym, swan neck deformity, boutonniere yeah. deformity. All this is getting at is the swan neck is talking about a flexion uh, deformity at your DIP. And then um, the boutonniere is when that flexion deformity is actually happening, happening at the PIP. You know, in both of these scenarios, what's happening here is that there's so much inflammation in the joint capsule that it's causing kind of adjacent erosion of the extensor digitorum tendon. It doesn't have to, and it can cause a tear, kind of like a, a button hole slip. But I think that's what boutonniere means in French, but, um, you know, and it doesn't have to cause like an entire, you know, tear, but maybe just like a little bit in that, you know, little part of that tendon and that, that um, phalange kind of pokes out. And the, the hallmark feature in RA and mixed connective tissue disease actually is that the inflammation is happening in the joint capsule. And so these deformities tend to be fixed. But in the video, we saw this guy with those deformities, yet he was actually able to reduce them. This is a feature of lupus, where in lupus, the joint pain is not actually because the inflammation is happening in the joint capsule. It's happening periarticularly. So these folks get like a tenosynovitis, kind of like the, the tendon sheaths is where the, the inflammation is happening. And so they may get this similar phenomenon, but it's not because the joint capsule has actually like caused some rupture or some partial tears, but more that there's inflammation of the tendon, they kind of over time get fibrosis. But like that joint is still able to move and it's still able to kind of reduce them so they can kind of flatten things out. Jacuda is like definitely a feature of lupus. You can also see it in sarcoid arthropathy, which is actually pretty rare. Um, I think some other things too, but it's a big, you know, it's, an, it's definitely associated with um, lupus. Yeah. That's Awesome, thank you. Then John Cho's asking, does it change management at all? Oh, uh, no, <laughs> we don't do much for it. Uh, and it tends not to be, you know, it's not going to cause like an erosive arthritis. So, um, it can be bothersome, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't necess necessitate strong immunosuppression for that particular manifestation of lupus. Always. And then I guess you know just reviewing like mixed connective tissue disease. <clears throat> kind of what are the things that would like you know make you say like this is what you would help diagnose, like make the diagnosis, just to go through that yeah. again. Mixed connective tissue disease is a really, um, it's almost kind of like a peculiar forgotten, you know, autoimmune disease. Um, it's part of a spectrum of lupus, but it has scleroderma features to it. And um, these folks um, have a tri triad, of inflammatory arthritis that can be erosive, Raynaud's phenomenon, and then usually pulmonary arterial hypertension. So that in combo with a um, serolo ANA serologies that match, typically SMRNP, highly specific for mixed connective tissue disease, will get that first thing this mixed connective tissue disease diagnosis, or also the U1 um, RNP antibody. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of this flavor of an arthritis that's more erosive. And it also patients will have um, kind of some scleroderma features too. And that's awesome. Um, I don't know, do we have enough time for another question? Or I think there's another thing at 10. I know that Chris Knight is on the uh, call now and is able to start his session shortly. Do you want to see if there are questions that people want to ask? Yeah, that would be wonderful. You have a wonderful hospitalist and a wonderful uh, rheumatology attending on the line now. So ask any questions that you want to ask any of them. All right. Well, certainly if they let me know, or certainly Dr. Chung is an expert and very knowledgeable about uh, all these rheumatologic uh, questions. So uh, thank you for imparting your wisdom. Yeah, thanks, Lauren, for the good questions. The, thank the you, Sarah and Lauren. Question. All right, thank you both so much for being here today. Um, we really appreciate that. Uh, I think we'll probably wrap up then and um, everyone do a quick stretch break while we get this transition over to Chris. <laughs>